Welcome to Half 3 GNT. Coming up in today's show, Georgina and Talia take a look at music from across the decades. This is a journey into sound. Hi, my name is what? My name is what? My name is <laughs> Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. Hello guys, we are GNT. We were going to start at half three, however, it's currently just past four due to technical difficulties. My name's Georgina. And I'm Talia. As we've already mentioned earlier today, we're going to be looking into how music developed across the eras. So, coming up on today's show, we have... An interview with a specialist vinyl collector, giving a bit of insight into the 60s. We were also fortunate enough to get an interview with darts member and musicians union secretary who will be telling us all about the 70s. Following that, we've got an incredible interview with artist manager and music consultant who was part of the Run DMC and Aerosmith collaboration. Next up, we have some help with the 90s from a sound to media sync operator and A&R scout. And to top it all off, director of Wonderland Management and Resolution Music Publishing House will tell us what he thinks about the future of music. But first... The 60s. Everyone is voting for Jack Cause he's got what all the rest lack This capsule history of our progress teaches us anything It is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred He's got high hopes 1960's the year for his the 60s was one of the most influential components to, de- to the development of music, and to cover this exciting era, we had our producer Liam interview an entrepreneurial vinyl record collector who gave his views on how music was affected at this period of time. The 60s was a time when music took a massive development. The styles in music, there were several which which occurred and came along. At the beginning of the 60s, um, there was the beat group scene, and this was uh, pop music uh, with a beat to it. And as the 60s progressed, the the, uh, maturing of the pop song occurred, really, and the uh, songwriters really came into their own during the 60s. Um, Later in the 60s, there was an era where music was highly influenced by drug taking known as uh, generally as the psychedelic era. beginning of the 60s um, not everyone had a telephone or a television set but by the end of the 60s um, it was much more commonplace most people had televisions in their house households so there was a complete change um, in um, technology uh, it became more integrated into people's lives As rock and roll was made famous by artists such as Elvis Presley for its connotations of sex, it drastically evolved into bands such as the Rolling Stones and Bowie who made sexual ambiguity the new icon. And it started with a multitude of drugs in... The 70s. You may not believe your eyes for this next group, but they're for real. The darts with Daddy Cool. Oh, a crazy chick running down the street. I say the pretty baby wife. So to help us with the 70s, we've managed to contact Horace Trubridge, who is the saxophone player and one of the songwriters for the band's darts, which was popular in the mid-70s and is also Assistant General Secretary for the Musicians' Union. He's given us a lot of insight into the 70s. First up, he talks about the variety of music at this time. He 
it was a fascinating time for music in the 70s. Well, I mean, I would say this because I had all my hits in the 70s, but for me it was one of the most exciting times because there was such a mixture of music out there. It wasn't just like two or three strands of music like we seem to have now. There was everything you could imagine, you know, uh, going on. If you take, for instance, like a, a program like Top of the Pops, which was, you know, the go-to program for people who like contemporary music, the thing about Top of the Pops was, in the 70s, was you could have, you know, one minute it was Motorhead, and then it was Boney M, uh, and then it would be the Jackson 5, um, and then it would be Donna Summer, and there was such a mixture of stuff. You know, hard rock, there was a hangover from the prog band, soul and disco, of course, and then you had a lot of reggae at that time, uh, particularly sort of pop-tinged reggae. There was... Um, bands writing great songs. I mean, look at the songs that Bowie wrote, and uh, you know, during the seventies, and Queen, fantastic band. Um, there was, you know, ABBA, great, amazing band, wrote fantastic songs. So, it's like I say, seventies was um, so many different things. You can't just pin it down to one thing. Music equipment had finally given artists more than four tracks to work with and music became much more experimental than it was technically capable of in the early 60s, which led to the rapid development of a variety of genres. Synthesizers were big in the 60s and 70s, but were too expensive for most artists to afford. In the early 70s, they developed a synthesizer that musicians could build themselves, meaning they could manipulate sounds and create our much-loved genres. This quickly evolved into punk, which Horace remembers very well. What we've learned in Britain is that we've gradually, over the last, certainly, 12 or 13 years, with perhaps a little interruption, gone slowly further and further away from the free society towards something else. Let's kick out the Tories The rulers of this land For they are the enemies Of the British working man When you get into 1976, as the birth of punk, punk was really a very politically driven music movement. You know, it was kids saying, we're sick to death of these fantastic shows that bands, these prog rock bands put on. They're so distant, that's not our lives. We want music that reflects our lives, dole cues and flyovers and, and poverty and just a general feeling of not being part of society, being detached from society, and that's what punk was all about. Let's get out the Tories. Yeah. Mid-70s punk was born out of a rebellion of the style of music. They rebelled against the economic state regarding Margaret Thatcher and over in the States, Richard Nixon. They wanted to strip back and not care about the typical rules of conventional music. Although Margaret Thatcher was well known for being one of the most hated women in Britain, she is also known for being the innovator of music. It is thought that without the tyranny of Thatcher, punk may have actually never happened. It seemed like the rich were getting richer whilst the poor were getting poorer. Punk and country were rivalling, but both spoke out about their hatred for Nixon and Thatcher. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I burn everything I've got. Now, what a gate does not bother me. Does your conscience bother you? Tell the truth. Sweet home, Alabama. Punk was just one example of the creativity and development of music in the 70s. Top of the Pop showcased all genres. Top of the Pops was absolutely the flagship for the music business, and, and, and it was the opinion former, it was the style leader. You waited to see what chart position you had on a Sunday. If you got a good chart position on Sunday, the next thing was, will you be told on Monday that you've got Top of the Pops? Getting Top of the Pops added sort of 50,000 to 100,000 uh, onto your sales. All that music of the 70s was featured on Top of the Pops, 
and it was such an extraordinary mixture. No other uh, decade has produced, in my opinion, such uh, a wide spectrum of um, music uh, in the pop charts. The 1st of January 1964 saw the first ever edition of the TV show Top of the Pops. During the 70s, Top of the Pops was in full swing and helped to shape the music industry, opening the world up to a wide selection of artists and music styles. Funk, soul, R&B, pop, hard rock, soft rock and disco all carved out their place in the music world in the 1970s, some of which crept their way into... The 80s! The 80s began with everyone having a new, tiny, portable stereo tape player. Sony created the Walkman and with this helped even more of the music listening public accept tapes as a viable home and personal music medium. The early Walkmans included two headphone jacks so the music could be enjoyed with a friend. With the birth of the Walkman also came the mass market for home recording. LPs could be recorded onto a blank cassette and then distributed among friends. Copyright laws were being broken and the anti-copyright infringement campaign by the British phonographic industry created the slogan, Home Taping is Killing Music. The Beatles rose to fame in the 60s when they gained popularity in the UK and then worldwide with their first hit, Love Me Do. Imagine there's no help. Millions of people mourned the tragic death of John Lennon today. Police said Lennon was shot by David Chapman, aged 25. There was a sad turn in 1980 when Beatles star Lennon was shot dead in the entrance of his apartment building in Dakota. In 1984, Band Aid was created by Bob Geldof and Midge Yuri in an attempt to raise money for anti-poverty efforts in Ethiopia. Big names from the time, such as Bono, Simon the Bon, Phil Collins, Paul Weller and over 30 other artists featured on the first instalment of Do They Know It's Christmas. It reached number one in the UK and sold millions of copies worldwide. But this, as you can imagine, is the second big thrill. Mr Chairman, Mr. Vice President to be in this convention, my fellow citizens of this great nation, I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Ronald Reagan was an actor, not at all a factor, just an employee of the country's real masters. I'm dropping off the grid before they pump the lid. I leave you with four words. I'm glad Reagan did. From the decaying inner cities emerged a new cultural movement. At first, people dismissed the music, saying it was a fad, but since became an enduring force in American pop culture, thus the start of hip-hop. In 1982, one of the pioneering acts in rap music, Grandmaster Flash, created The Message, a record that captured the raw desperation of black urban life in Ronald Reagan's America. Grandmaster Flash took rap from the house parties to the mainstream with their hit single, The Message. This hip-hop song added a social lyrical commentary, later developed by groups such as Public Enemy and NWA. For this segment, we had the great privilege of getting an, an exclusive interview with Steve Lee, who is the owner and operator of World Lee Consulting and an artist manager. He previously worked at Virgin Records and Profile Records, who were the team that made the Run DMC and Aerosmith collaboration a reality for the musically divided 80s. The Run DMC Aerosmith collaboration, the label Profile Records was smart enough to see what the conditions were happening in America, specifically at that time. You know, to be honest, we all looked like geniuses, but we were very, very fortunate. Uh, during the mid-80s, because of the glut, it was no strange fact that there was a lot of payola going on, that people were actually paying lots of money or corrupting DJs or program directors to play records on the radio stations because that was the big business at that time. That's how business actually happened. So what happened during the 1984-1985, uh, the U.S. Senate got involved to start investigating the corruption that was happening in the entertainment industry, specifically in the music business. All of the major labels, whether you were Columbia, Warner Brothers, Polygram, all pulled back. Profile Records, being an independent label, saw that this was an opportunity, and that was part of the 
instigation to cross over Run DMC Aerosmith track, which was a, a beautiful track that reinvigorated Aerosmith's career for one and brought Run DMC, who was already an R&B, hip hop, what they call black mom and pop store America artist into the mainstream. It was a point where we had the ability to chart a record into the Billboard Top 100. When you charted a record at the Billboard Top 100, all of a sudden you were available to go into white mainstream. So all of a sudden you had Run DMC in mall stores all across America. Even when Walk This Way came out, FM radio rock stations in America refused to play it. It wasn't until we actually got MTV to start uh, airing the video that had started being turned around saying, oh gosh, I guess we do have an audience with, with white America. With the emergence of rap, artists were being signed to record labels and with guidance came collaborations with different genres. A famous unusual collaboration to come out of the 80s was with Aerosmith and Run DMC, with Steven Tyler and Joe Perry guesting on the cover, Walk This Way. It reached the top ten in 1986. Music television, or as it's more commonly referred to as MTV, changed the way that people consume music. Music was now not only heard through radio and cassette, but seen on TV as well. The first song that was shown on MTV was The Buggles, Video Killed the Radio Star. I heard you on the wireless back in 52 Lying awake intently tuning in on you If I was young it didn't stop you coming through I think the defining moment for the 1980s was MTV. It's the first time people got to see on a regular basis a lot of bands they were interested in without actually leaving their home. They could watch it on TV. They would still obviously go out to shows and things like that. But before that, music was this mystical, magical thing that you heard on the radio. You were left to your own imagination of what it was like and what you were actually feeling. But MTV underscored the whole persona of popular music. And it started with, obviously, The Buggles was the first. And that was so apparent and that was so prophetic that you could have bands coming on to the scene that would visually impact the music to a degree that was never seen before. So you had bands like Duran Duran, Culture Club, Cindy Lauper's, bands that couldn't necessarily travel the world in one instant were all of a sudden accessible through the, the visual medium. Uh, videos became very, very important, and that's why budgets for videos skyrocketed. They saw that the importance of, uh, of a video companion to the music was integral to the whole strategy of promoting and marketing an artist. People like Michael Bay started off doing music videos, for instance. MTV carried on its popularity well into... The 90s. We had an in-depth discussion with Dex Lush, head of music business at the Brighton Institute of Modern Music, artist manager, A&R scout, promoter and most currently sync operator about 90s music culture. Rave culture started in the 80s and was most prominent in the early 90s. Dex Lush is going to explain to us how the phenomenon developed. Just what is it that you want to do? Well, we want to be free. We want to be free to, to do what we want to do. And we want to get loaded. And we want to have a good time. And that's what we're going to do. Well, wait, baby, let's go. In the very early 90s, sort of like 91, 92, whilst you had all those indie genres going on, you had rave culture uh, in full swing, grunge music, that held sway for a year or two. But simultaneously to that, you had what primal screen bands like that were doing with mixing indie and electronic dance forms and those two things created you know a whole new interest in dance music because now it wasn't just an underground thing in terms of drug culture and rave culture it became something of a pastime for all young people and I mean a lot of people would have been drawn to it because of the drug aspect and so that fueled it uh, certainly you know it made it cool 
The music was heavily influenced by XC, Speed and Acid, not only for the listeners, but for the artists who created the music. Acid, drum and bass and jungle were all influenced by drugs, having these styles originally evolved from the innovative indie and electronic collaborations. In fact, forward-thinking bands such as Primal Scream started to use hip-hop beats as instrumental samples and would add live instruments over the top. Rap and hip-hop were politically driven. It moved from simplistic party song format and developed into a subgenre of gangster rap. The birth of gangster rap revolved around telling gritty life stories and promoting a lifestyle of sex and violence, but was criticised for its harsh language and violent and sexual lyrics. 90s was the decade of peak sales in hip-hop, with the success of artists such as Dr Dre, Eminem, Tupac, Wu-Tang and Snoop Dogg making a huge impact on music culture. But rap and hip-hop still wasn't properly being made in the UK. Instead, we were focused more on Britpop. Our interview with Dex revealed how the politics at the end of time helped push his new genre. much documented, I guess, that still in the early 90s we were in conservative rule. I think by the early 90s everybody was getting so angry, either very angry or disenfranchised. But of course, by the time we got to the mid-90s, if there was a change, when Labour got in, you got Cool Britannia and Britpop, and then suddenly it was all everybody getting excited about the new change, and then you had this whole sort of period of, I guess, sort of almost uh, hedonism and hope. So the 90s was almost evenly divided by those two things. And then, of course, in the middle of all that, from a musical perspective, is Britpop, which was sort of like the corporate takeover. But at the same time, as uh, the major labels were signing up all the indie bands, they were also signing up the underground drum and bass acts. We had Goldie, acts like Fotec being signed up for a lot of money. So during that Britpop era, the major label really trying to make the most of all these genres and scenes and trying to package them up. And of course, they were most successful with indie and making it a new corporate rock. Great Invasion saw the rise of shoegaze performances where music was the sole focus. They rebelled against the conventions of music and the showmanship of performing. Artists like Oasis and the Stone Roses weren't ashamed of their working class backgrounds, which is emulated in their personas. Britpop reached America and impacted on their own music. It influenced grunge and they had a similar attitude towards performing, where they preferred to look as though they were an audience member. Grunge was quick to rise and fall. It emerged in 91 and had come to an end in 96 due to many of the bands splitting and the controversial death of Kurt Cobain. Grunge had elements of hardcore punk and heavy metal in its songs with angst-filled lyrics and themes of social alienation, confinement and desire for freedom. Nirvana was like nothing else on the radio at the time, but lead singer Kurt Cobain was stuck in a mental prison. He was now part of the corporation the band and music fought against. This, along with his heroin addiction, led him to commit suicide in 94, aged only 27. Many grunge bands broke up in the 90s, leading to its demise. Kurt Cobain also helped bring girl power headlines, with his unwavering support, as Dex Lush is going to explain. From the early 90s, there was a strong movement coming from America, and I remember the Grill Power, G Triple R L Power. They had Bikini Kill, and probably to a lesser extent, the L Sevens, and all those uh, big sort of grunge rock and alternative rock bands from America coming over, and those influencing Grill Power indie bands over here. So in the UK, we had bands like Huggy Bear that were appearing on TV doing Agit Pop punk. So that, that was firing off and I think by the time we get to the mid-90s that sort of girl power thing was then being packaged up neatly into a corporate way with the Spice Girls. They basically appropriated girl power and turned it into a pop thing. The big fanzine movement, and it had the endorsement of Kirk Bain. So they were connected to the stars at the time. Girl and boy bands were the rebirth of pop. Bands such as Spice Girls, Destiny's Child, Backstreet Boys and NSYNC were huge, but solo females tended to be more successful. 
with all this knowledge of what has gone before, what is... The future of music as we know it. Now, there has been little development from the early noughties to now, and with a decade having passed and not much to show for it, is there still hope for the music industry? We asked Keith McCall, the Director of Wonderland Management and Resolution Music Publishing House, to share his thoughts on the future of music, and I'd like to pre-warn you, it may not be as cheerful as you're expecting. Without being doom and gloom merchant, like I think, you know, fundamentally the music business as as it has been known for the past hundred years, probably had its peak time, like it has had its peak moment, without a doubt. Fundamentally, from I guess the last six, seven years, it really talks about brands, but they really will just be brands. It will be Justin Timberlake, as brought to you by Beats Headphones, Coca-Cola, Universal Pictures, HBO, and Universal Music plugged in the background as well. Really, in the 80s and 90s, and the boom times for music, 70s, 80s, 90s, people didn't have a lot of choices to spend their money on. I know that sounds daft. They did, but they didn't. So as a as a young person, what you're spending your money on now is millions of different things. It's more important to look cool than it is to be culturally cool. It's mobile phones have changed the planet Earth as we know it. People don't have the attention spans. As I say, you would sit down, you take 45 minutes of your life out, physically sit in a seat, listen to a record, go and turn it over halfway through and sit back down and listen to the other half. But very, very few people, I'd imagine, do that. I, I certainly struggle to do that even myself. Creatively, rock and roll gets born in the 50s out of the blues and people play songs that last three minutes and say, I love you, sha la 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 And essentially, we haven't progressed from that, really, in all truth. There's no recorded sound that is going to surprise people anymore. The only time that will happen is if somebody goes away and builds a machine that we've never heard anything like. In the same way that Moog builds a synthesizer in the 60s or whatever, and we hear for the first time, that's pretty fucking blown. That must have blew people's brains out. What is left to surprise our ears now? Are we regurgitating the past? Of course we are. Always have been to an extent. I find it weird that your generation makes this sort of disconnected music. It's almost like the death pop is eating itself live in front of our eyes, almost in a funny way. It's strange times for music, no doubt. So, yeah, that was a little bit uh, depressing. I mean, as a music advocate, it's kind of sad to know that a lot of the best music was actually before my time. <laughs> yeah, it is a shame. But I still feel like we're coming out with some more right stuff at the minute. I, I think it depends. I don't... I don't... I wouldn't say it was as innovative. Like, I, I, I do totally agree with what he said. Um, as in, music... There's no sound that we will hear that's going to be like, oh my God, what was that? Like, I can't imagine a new genre. Yeah, I suppose. Maybe it'll come, I don't know. But, like, is there a point where music sort of stops evolving well clearly it's (laughs) clearly it's come upon us i mean like you said if we kind of get to a point where somebody invents us like a machine that will make a sound i think that will be the new thing i mean i like what chance the rapper's doing where he's making rap melodic but even then that's not that innovative that's not that inventive i wouldn't say i suppose it's getting harder as time goes on because it has all been done before i think one of the main things that I took away from what Keith said was the fact that nobody these days sits down and just enjoys music. I think it's a real shame. I feel like we miss out on that. Um, I think my New Year's resolution is going to be to start appreciating music more. Well, I definitely agree. I think that when I go out this Christmas, I'm going to buy some CDs and just sit back and enjoy some music definitely with no distractions whatsoever yeah but i'd like to say that i'm going to enjoy music the way that it's supposed to that's what i will do with black friday coming up on the 27th of november it's a great opportunity to support the music industry and educate yourself in music Amazon have some great deals on new released music, all for just under £5 for physical copies. And this deal lasts the entire week. So let's sit down and appreciate music the way we were supposed to. That's all from us today on the Half 3 GNT. 
Join us next week where we'll be interviewing some up-and-coming musicians and label heads who believe they have the answer to the future of music. I've been Georgina. And I've been Talia. Goodbye and thank you for listening. I voice what you want, the children of